Rev it up and welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 1,237. What would you attempt to do if you knew you could not fail? This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. Hey, this is Mark Green. Join me at the Classic Auto Show in Costa Mesa, California, this March 16th and 17th at the Orange County Fair and Events Center. I'll be the Celebrity Stage MC conducting live interviews with past Cars Yeah guests, including Adam Carolla, the Grand Marshal, Dave Kindig from Bitchin' Rides, Wayne Carini from Chasing Classic Cars, Mark Warman from Graveyard Cars, Mike Finnegan from Roadkill, Bogey from All Girls Garage, Big Mike, Import Tuner and Builder, and Lynn St. James, an iconic race car driver. I hope I'll see you at the Classic Auto Show. For more information, go to theclassicautoshow.com. That's theclassicautoshow.com. Hello, automotive enthusiasts. I'm revved up and so excited to introduce today's very special guest calling in from beautiful Portland, Oregon, Matt Teske. Matt, are you buckled up and ready for a fun ride? As always, let's do this. All right. Matt Teske is a marketing director and brand strategist with 20 years of experience in the automotive industry. His talents caught the attention of General Motors when he was just 19 years old, which led to a career managing numerous special projects and marketing campaigns for automotive OEM clients, including Chevrolet, Toyota, dealerships, and aftermarket companies. His work has been featured in publications including Forbes, Motor Trend, Newsweek, The Verge, and at major shows including SEMA and NYIAS. Matt develops Chargeway after years of research into the electric car industry. His conclusion, in order for electric cars to move beyond early adopters, there needs to be an easier way to explain and enjoy electric fuel. Chargeway replaces the technical and engineering-based language with a more simple visual explanation. I'm really looking forward to this. That's what I need, a more simple visual explanation. So, Matt, I've told our listeners a little bit about you. Would you take a brief moment and share a little more about your career and your passion for automobiles before I jump into the questions? Perfect. Definitely. I am definitely a car guy, and that's how a lot of my friends have referred to me over the years. And that passion started at a young age. I was always uh, enamored with basically anything that went fast. So that included cars. One of my first loves for something that was fast with design was the SR-71 Blackbird. I really wanted to be a pilot when I was a kid. It just wasn't to be meant to be in that sense, but cars were that other love that I could, you know, just see something and be interested by it. So that was uh, drawn in by design usually, and then uh, what it could do from performance. And so that was just always there. I mean, everything from, you know, being a little kid playing with Hot Wheels. I mean, that was part of how I grew up, right? Yeah. And it just led into what was, you know, what was the iterative step? So getting your license, well, that was great. But then I was thinking, well, what do I want to drive? And, and how do I want to enjoy this passion for cars. And I never wanted to be like everyone else in the crowd, though. I always wanted to do something that was unique and stand out. And so even when I had the chance to get my first car, I wanted to stand out uh, from my buddies in Southern California, where I grew up. Most of them had imports, uh, most of them, you know, Hondas, Acuras, Mitsubishis. And I went a totally different route and ended up getting a, a Chevy Cavalier, to the, it was a head scratcher for all my friends in Southern California, <laughs> but yeah. it was it was a Z24. So this thing had more torque than horsepower. So I could just you know beat the snot out of them in a quarter mile drag race because I had what they didn't have. And so it was uh, that's where that kind of started to become a tangible thing for me. But then as I was doing that, I was also getting interested in design work and you know working with graphic programs. This is even pre Photoshop. And just, you know, learning how to you know, get involved in the design side of what could happen within automotive. And, and while I wasn't designing the cars, I was crafting what I think is just the storytelling behind why cars and transportation matters to people. And that led to a very neat combination of me working on my car, designing my own car, modifying it, and then, you know, working behind the scenes in the digital world to mesh those two things. And it led to a very interesting career. Again, as you mentioned, the the clients and projects I've been able to work on over the years have been have been a lot of fun. The people I've met have been great. Uh, the mentors along the way, that's where it kind of started out. Now, for the last 10 years or more, I've been very interested in, well, what's next? Because I, as I was as a kid, I wanted to look at well, what was new, what was different. I don't want to be like everyone else. And the progress that we were seeing in, in electric vehicles really had been catching my eye for for decades. 
but it had been slowly progressing. And in the last you know 15 years or so, it's it's really you know turned a corner. I have just looked at that and said, well, that's what I think we should really be focusing on. It's the future. I think it's fun. But it's still in this world where it's genuinely odd to people, I think, to a lot of mainstream drivers and just consumers. And I kept looking at what that, why was that the case? And people love cars. And I love cars. Most people love cars. It's an extension of their identity very often. And I found that in conversations with people, they understood cars, but that word electric, it just made them scratch their head. And that word electric for electric car defines the fuel. And so I kept doing some research in, into this, and I, I kept finding that people understand and love cars, whether it's a dealership trying to sell one or a consumer wanting to own and drive one, but understanding how electric fuel worked for your daily life and comparing it to the ease of gasoline uh, was something that people didn't fully understand how to make it work for them. And so I wanted to find a way to make it as easy as possible for them to see how it works and, and again, capture the imagination of the general public for where we're going with the future of transportation. Very cool. Well... What's next? What's next for you, Matt, is to share a success quote or a mantra with me before we get into a deeper dive with Chargeway and what you're doing with this. I always like to ask my guests this question because uh, it's pretty instrumental in forming how you look at life and, and your success. And it's a nice way to get the inspirational tires turning here on cars. Yeah. So, Matt, take the wheel. The the first thing that comes to mind is actually... My wife, an older brother, one sibling, and and he and I are are very different kind of how we approach things. But uh, he he knows me very well. And one time, it was just out of the blue, randomly, he sent me a card, and in the card was a magnet. And on the card, uh, you know, or rather on the magnet, it said, "What would you attempt to do if you knew you could not fail?" Mm. And in, and inside the card, he said, "I've never seen you crash and burn." <laughs> and I was and I was like, "Whoa, this is cool!" Like you know, it was a really thoughtful thing to get from oh yeah from yeah. a sibling. But it really it he helped me see kind of what I think that I've done over the years. And I've tried a lot of different things. Again, I've, I've again, from high school and, and getting involved with the automotive world. And I mean, the first sponsor I had for a car, I was 17 years old. And, wow. and so I, I learned how to, and again, I stumbled into it, but I then learned how to turn that into something that was a lot of fun and very unique. And, uh, but over the years, I've tried various things, whether it was related to, you know, building new cars, starting businesses. Again, I operated a marketing and branding agency for 12 years called Teskey Design. And that's where a lot of my work was done in the industry. But even I also started a clothing line that operated for about six years. And we worked with a lot of projects in the automotive space as a lifestyle element to that conversation. And so that was a lot of fun. So I, I live kind of by that mantra of I, I don't see how I'm not going to make it happen. And, and my older brother pointed that out. He said, you will things into existence. When you want to try something, you do it and you basically do it. And I, he's like, I've never seen that before. So that, <laughs> that's that been a lot of fun uh, having someone from the outside point that out uh, about me. And it's it, it means a lot. So that's kind of, yeah, I guess I'd live by that mantra. I love that. You know, it's it's awesome idea and even more special that it came from a sibling. There's an old saying that I recall, and if I say this correctly, you can fail at what you don't want, so you might as well take a chance doing what you love. Oh, yeah. And that whole concept is, you know, I think the misnomer of so many people have that they get a job with some company, big or small, and they think there's safety in that. And as you get a little wiser and older, you realize there really isn't always much safety in that. Right. If anything, talk to a guy yesterday who'd worked for a company for almost 20 years and all of a sudden they had new ownership and he was told goodbye. It was really nice, but we don't really want you here anymore. Right. Like, what? You know, so, uh, yeah, take a chance, take a leap, go out there and try something. That's what Cars Yeah podcast is all about. People that have done exactly that. Well, let's go back in time. Now, we know you're a car guy, but I'd love for you to share a story that instigated your personal passion for cars. Is there a a pivotal moment as you remember it in your life, maybe it was on the kitchen floor with those uh, Hot Wheels, uh, <laughs> where you knew you were going to be a car guy for life. I could probably point to countless different little moments, uh, even those included with with you know something like nostalgia and toys. I, I, I vividly remember you know ordering a Hot Wheel through Rice Krispies when I was like six years old, <laughs> and it was this really particular one, but the design of it was so funky and cool, and I just wanted it. But I think that translated into me being uh, older when I think the first car that really made my eyes just pop wide open. And, and I said, I, I got to be involved with this industry was the Dodge Viper. When the first RT10 was unveiled, I, that to me was the pinnacle of that's what a car should be. And the first time I ever saw one in person, I was actually traveling with family. And of all places, it was in Idaho. 
And it was at this specialty car dealership. And we drove by and I saw it out the window and I had literally made my parents go back so I could just go in and see it. And the people in the showroom were great. They said, yeah, yeah, he can go in and stand next to it. And so I had this picture of me standing next to a Dodge Viper. And it, was, it meant the world to me. And then, you know, fast forward four or five years, I got to finally ride in one uh, on another odd enough family trip uh, where there's just one of the neighbors had one across the street from where this uh, family we were visiting. And so... Those moments just it began to, you know, it went from the, I could envision, envision it in my mind to, I can now touch it and see it. Now I get to ride in it. And then I was able to start turning it into, well, what can I do with this? And so the, I think, and then when it became something I owned and something that became a way for me to really engage was that the first car I had when I said, this is the car that I want. This is how I'm going to be unique in this and I'm going to make it my own. That's when it became very tactile. And I could take those things I was always thinking of in my mind. And I had this three-dimensional canvas. And so modifications for cars and customizing and tuning became a real big part of my early career because that was it was a way to express yourself. And you could take a palette and turn it into what you wanted. And then the best compliment you could get from people was anybody from the outside looking in at your creation saying, that's really cool. You did a yeah. great job. And I always yeah. loved that part. Yeah, very, very cool. You know, I always thought it was pretty cool in the late 80s when uh, Bob Lutz, obviously at Chrysler at the time, uh, talked to the, I think it was the head of their Chrysler Design Center, Tom Gale, and said, hey, we should produce, a, I think the way he said it was a modern Cobra. Mm -hmm. And if you stop and think about this in the in the 80s, that was a pretty bold thing to do mm -hmm. uh, for for the agency and for, you know, a specialty car like that that had a very limited market. And for Tom to take that and explore and then end up coming out with what he came out with. And I remember when that car came out, it was almost like, whoa. Oh, it, it, it just, it turned heads. I mean, the stories you were, you would hear about people that were sending million dollar checks into, into Chrysler and Dodge saying, we just want this car. It's and they're like, that's not how this works. We'll, we'll call you when it's in a production model, you know? Yeah. But I, yeah. I think what they did really, really well though, is, is when they unveiled what the conceptual Viper would be, they didn't deviate. They really right. said, this is what you're going to get. And it was, I think that really speaks to capturing the imagination of the public when it comes to what they want out of a car and what people aspire them to own. I think when a concept car comes out and you can tell it's outlandish, it might get some press for a while, but it, people kind of have that little voice in their head saying, you know, it's not going to be that right. Any, any manufacturer that captures the concept well into a production model, I think they get it right. And then for, but we've also seen the same tried and true uh, solutions over the years. I mean, even the Mustang, when it first came out, you could really customize it. You could really make it your own. And, and it made for an iconic car over the years that everybody was attracted to. And, those models have been used again, you know, and those those tactics such as, you know, when Scion was developed by Toyota, it was the with the intent of saying this is this is the first car you're going to have and you can do what you want to to make it your own with your personality. But it was a, a cradle to grave tactic to get you into a Scion to then move you into a Camry. And then inevitably you'd want to buy your Lexus. Right. So, well, it's, it's great when designers or companies, manufacturers let designers go. I know I had Camilo Pardo who designed the first Ford GT. Uh, on this show, and we talked at length, and I met him at the Quail um, a couple summers ago and got to spend some time with him, actually drove him over to another car show and got to hear some of the inside story. Mm -hmm. And I really commend car manufacturers that pull this kind of stuff off because that first Ford GT and, of course, the new one now, which is even more outlandishly oh, wild yeah. and crazy and cool. So, yeah, I love this stuff. Very, very cool. Well, I want to take a look at some of the roads you've driven down now and talk about a big challenge. Or even better, a big failure you, you faced along the way. But the most important part of this is what did it teach you? So kind of walk us through one of those scenarios and, and tell us how that specific experience helped you gain even more momentum in your career, your business, and or your life. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd say probably the biggest challenge I faced was uh, in recent years, actually, in the last four or five years, was essentially starting a new chapter. I'd been working you know, in automotive for a long time. Uh, my agency had been doing a lot of great projects, but I felt that I had to a certain extent, lost sight of the purpose of why I got into it in the first place. You know, and, and it was about design. It was about being creative. It was about developing you know, new ideas and, and really helping advance things. And I felt that it sort of turned into being a, a repetition of what we'd always seen. It kind of felt, I felt like I had stagnated. And the challenge then was, as you pointed out earlier, it's like, well, I had something going that was comfortable. It's like that person that's been at a job that they say, oh, I'm at the big job. This is safe. And I kind of felt that way, but it was an oddity because it was a thing that I created that I was no longer really enjoying as much as I used to. Ah, okay. And so I felt 
kind of awkwardly trapped. And, yeah. and, and, <laughs> yeah. and I had, again, I had clients I was working with that were, were, again, we had a lot of great projects going, there were a lot of fun, but I, I had lost some of that spark. And I think what it ended up being, uh, was the challenge of really being honest to myself of, okay, I need to change this. And the, and the only way I can do that is if I change it. Cause I started this, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have to be the one, but then I, I was, but I felt very, I, I, you know, I had clients that relied on us, uh, for what the work we were doing. And I felt very accountable to them and I didn't want to leave anybody hanging. So it was a process by which to, you know, admit to myself that I knew I needed to try something new again and then go through the process to make sure I made good on all of the relationships we had and didn't just basically say, well, I want to change. I'm out of here. And then, for example, just, you know, leave everybody high and dry. So that was a, but being, to the, getting to the point of being honest to myself about wanting to make that change was important. And that change ended up being that the passions I had in the background were still about being focused on what's coming next and how to be part of something new and different and really elevating that. And I, then that was the, the decision of what does that look like? And it really wasn't going to be a part of my agency. It was going to be something new. So that was ah, okay. It brings to mind, I had a guest on the show here who is a car guy through and through. He also has a, a consulting coaching business and he posed some, some thoughtful questions. His name's Tony Watley on his Facebook page every day because he has a, a group of Facebook followers who follow him and he's uh, obviously working on building his coaching business. But today's, you trigger something in today's and that is, do you start with the end in mind? And most of the people responding going, well, I don't even know what tomorrow is going to be. <laughs> right. What do you mean the end in mind? But if you've been in business for a while, you start to realize the importance of that. And especially as you biz- build a business, let me ask you this. When you started your your design firm, did you do that? Did you have a specific, not only an exit strategy of, okay, what am I building here and why? Because most people that build businesses expect to sell them someday. And there's a reason for that. You know, they want to build up something, but when it's time to leave, for whatever reason, there's a value there. They can walk away, whether it's with a small amount of money or in the case of some very fortunate people, very, very large amounts of money that free them up, start new companies or whatever. Did you have that kind of forethought when you started that particular business? It, actually, no, it was it was completely organic and just how it kind of started uh, happening in my mind. I mean, oh, okay. out, of, out of school. So when I was a, in college... I actually interned at uh, McMullen Argus and Prime Media uh, before it became uh, Source Interlink and before it became uh, 10. It offered up an opportunity to get a job out of school working with them on marketing and events and, and for Super Street Magazine, Eurotuner. And it was, in my mind, that was a dream because I'd been working in that industry for so long, modifying my own car and, and meeting all these people. I thought, oh man, I finally made it. And what I realized was, is all the stuff that I was really having fun with and really good at outside of the workplace was what I really loved. And I ended up only after being at that job for a year, I basically, I said, I, I got to try something new. And I remember, I remember I took my dad to dinner and I said, yeah, so I think I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to become a consultant. And, <laughs> and at the time I was you know, tw- 23 years old and he looks, he looks at me, he goes, what are you talking about? <laughs> you don't consult at 23, you know? And so, right. Yeah. Uh, but Who can you consult anybody? Like, Maybe a teenager on how to get through high school. <laughs> exactly. He's looking at me thinking, you don't have the wisdom yet to do what you're doing. And, right. and yeah. so, but it, I knew what I wanted to do was going to be different. I just, but again, to your, to your question about exit strategy and what that vision was, the vision was I knew I was really having a good time and also capable of being more effective and efficient uh, when I was doing things away from that corporate structure. And so that's what I knew. And I didn't know what that would lead to. But I, at, even at that age, I knew I had to try. And I also knew that if I tried then and failed, that the only thing that would end up being impacted potentially was me. Is it really was, I was young enough. I mean, I didn't have a family yet. I didn't, you know, I really was in a place where I could be maybe a little bit more uh, aggressive and take some risk. Yeah, excellent. I love it. Great uh, direction this conversation went. One thing I'm going to throw out to my listeners here when it comes to change whether it's expected or unexpected, there's a great book by Dr. Spencer Johnson. It's titled "Who Moved My Cheese," <laughs> and it's. Have you read that book? I have not, but I've heard of it. I've heard it's great. It's awesome book. Um, I, I really love that book. And in fact, I gave both my kids that book when they went through the transition from high school to college, and then urged them to read it again as they graduated and went out on their careers. And uh, for those listeners who are regular listeners, they've heard me mention this before, but it's a really fantastic book. It's simple. It's easy to read. You can read it in an afternoon pretty much, but it really is important when it comes to expecting change and realizing that 
we don't control our own destinies most of the time and things can change and our cheese can be moved Right, and uh, we need to be able to adapt. So I'll just leave it right there. Let's have a little bit of fun and talk about your first really special car, vehicle, whatever it might be, and maybe share a memory you have about that ride. Wow, that's it's it's going to sound funny, but it it is that Z twenty four Cavalier that I had as a kid. <laughs> uh, it's it's so funny because it's not the car you'd think of, but it's it because of my taking that path and choosing that car, it it truly led to the career that I have, and I can't say it any other way. It it because of it. I was able to meet a variety of people in the aftermarket that were based in Southern California from the, uh-huh. you know, and, and that led to opportunity. Uh, but then it led to new opportunities of meeting people at OEMs, again, such as Chevrolet. And I have a vivid memory of uh, one of my really close friends over the years uh, growing up in the industry that was a, a great help to me understanding how the industry worked and also a mentor in a lot of ways. His name was Bob Kern. He worked for General Motors for years. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was uh, what the, their SEMA manager and, their, and their, their SEMA planner for everything they did at, at the SEMA show every year. One year, uh, at, he invited me to be uh, included at GM's booth at the International Auto Salon. And that was in Long Beach. I vividly remember there was media there. They're inside the booth. There's a lot of great cars there. They were interviewing John Moss, who was the head of uh, GM's you know, concepts and specialty projects uh, for years. I remember John, was he walked over and he, he leaned on my car as they were interviewing him and talking about the GM space. And I remember Bob leaned over and just said, that should be a big compliment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I remember thinking, okay. You know, and, and again, what that showed me was I, I had a knack for you know, getting the right package put together. Uh, and because of that car, it and again, it had iterations over the years. You know, it, I, I painted it, had multiple different sets of wheels. Uh, it had a supercharger on it that actually worked with General Motors on uh, mm-hmm. for their supercharger program for the LD9 motor before the Ecotech platform came out. And yeah. they actually used my car when I was in college. They took my car on a tour around the nation with their Ecotech power tour. And I was in I was in college at Gonzaga University in Spokane, Washington, taking classes and saying to people, Oh yeah, my car is being borrowed by General Motors. It's in Atlanta right now. Wow. You know, so nice. that was <laughs> That's kind very of cool. eye opening thing for me that was just like, oh this is di-. again to me, I'm like, well this is just kind of how it goes. And people kept saying no, that's not. What are you talking about? That doesn't happen to anybody. So that 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 car did it. Are you are you, you're talking about Bob Kerner? Uh, no, K- Bob, Bob Kern, K E R N. I had a Bob Kerner on the show here that uh, uh, had a similar background. I thought maybe we were talking about the same guy, but uh, uh, maybe not. I'm sure there's a lot of Bob Kerns around. A lot of Bob Kerners around. So no con- no concerns here. But is there a seller's remorse story in your life that you'd want to share? Uh, I, one of my favorite cars I've ever owned, uh, was a Mark IV Volkswagen R32. That car, it, it was one of those ones that I always had, I always had my eye on it. And I was, I, when that came out, I was like, oh, that's just a cool car. And that car I bought, uh, actually uh, from a private party seller in Maryland. And I flew from Oregon to Maryland sight unseen with the cashier's check. And I said, just send me photos. If there's no rest, I'm buying this car. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> I, I bought it and I drove it across the country and actually met up with a buddy of mine in Wisconsin and, and, and cause he had never been to Portland. So I said, Hey man. And he, he's a buddy I knew from the car forums back in the day. And so I picked him up and I will vividly remember that part is driving along with him. He gets in the car and he looks over, he goes, Oh wow, this thing's a stick. <laughs> and I said, yeah, why? He goes, oh, dude, I don't drive a stick. <laughs> oh, uh-oh. Road trip. <laughs> right. I said, <laughs> Tough road trip. <laughs> you're kidding me. And so he said, no. He's like, tell you what, let's get up to speed. And then we're on the highway. We'll just switch seats. I said, oh, gosh. <laughs> no, I've had this thing for a day. I'm not wrecking it like that, you know? So Yeah, yeah. But that that car, I had it for only a couple of years. And I ended up selling it just simply because I didn't, I didn't use it as, as much as I think I should have. It was my only car at the time. But looking back on it, it was one of the most fun cars out of the box. I mean, from the factory, that car was awesome. You get you'd get thumbs up from people that were driving Porsches because they knew uh, that's a that's a cool little car. Yeah, you know? yeah. And so that one, if I could hide that in a garage one day again and find one that's in good shape, I think I could find a way to justify it. But you know, I'm also so interested and excited about electric cars now that I'm like, well, I've driven electric cars that are a lot faster than that. So I don't oh know. yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So the big question is. Did your buddy know how to drive a stick ship by the time you guys got to Portland? No, he did what? not. He didn't even try. Uh, oh, geez. I had to let him out in Tucson. <laughs> well, at one point we we're driving along and I told him, I said, hey, if you're not driving, you're staying awake. And yeah. we, we drove from basically Chicago to Salt Lake City in one shot. And, oh, my goodness. And he was dozing off a few different times. And I just basically just you know punched him in the arm like, you, you better stay awake, man. This this is our road trip. So, But yeah, that was, it made for a fun story, though. It was always a lot of fun. So There you go. 
Well, I'd love for you to share with our listeners a lot more about Chargeway. What is this all about? Why are, why would people be interested in this? And how are you help keeping people uh, more informed about uh, this new phenomenon, which really goes back to the first car Porsche built, which was electric. Yeah. So it really isn't that new. I was just at the California Automobile Museum and saw a very cool, I think it was a 1911 electric car. So you know, this isn't a new concept, but now it's coming to reality for all of us. And it's it's the way we're going to all be driving. So Chargeway, what's it all about? It's Chargeway by definition is it, we, we brand electric fuel and we make it easy to use electricity as a fuel. The reason why I really dove into that conversation was because I found that you know, we have this transition happening in the industry and we, we call these new cars electric cars. And as I mentioned earlier, that word electric solely revolves around the fuel. That's why we define it that way. And I found that what was happening in the industry is there was really no effort being made to simplify how we have that conversation. There's a, all the technology that's been developed that has brought them to the place where they are now currently is amazing. And what's happened is a lot of that has been done through brilliant engineers and also through even policy that has helped you know push renewables and, and some of these projects forward. But there was really never a touching point on, well, how do we convert this conversation into something that the general public will understand? And I think that there, there was this missed mark of the fact that any consumer today, especially here in North America and the United States, they don't have to think much about when they get fuel for their car. They don't ever think about it. If they go and buy a brand new car, they never question how they make it run. They go and buy the car that they want, whether that's a shape of an SUV or a sports car or a sedan or a particular brand. And the sales reps have the same notion. They say, well, we don't have to explain how the thing works. It just works. We want to sell them on why it's just a fun car for them to own. And so what I found is all the efforts being made in the electric vehicle industry, it really kept coming back to that there was not a, a clear way to explain how you make the fuel work. You know, phrases, I mean, I'm not sure how familiar you are with electric cars, but the plug types, the names that are being used with the general public include J1772 and Chatamo and CCS Combo <laughs> SAE Standard. And I'm thinking... People that drive cars know that they just go get regular. They're not going to learn this new language. Yeah. Is this some kind of coding fuel? Right. <laughs> like, <laughs> exactly. Right. And so, and what, and there's more depth to it. There's alternating current and direct current. There's, there's 7.2 AC kilowatt for your house. And then there's 50 DC kilowatt for fast charging away from home. And it's just this very interesting combination, cornucopia of phrases and engineering that the competitive product is not there yet, in my view. Yeah. And, yeah. and so, yeah. If the industry really wants to accelerate electric vehicles uh, with the general public, there has to be an easier way to engage with the fueling. And so uh, there's a brand, I mean, brands like Tesla, they've captured it. Their ecosystem is, is very, it's just sexy. They said, look, you can buy this car and not screw it up. When you get in this car, there's a big screen in it. It tells you where you can go when you want to go somewhere. It'll plan your trip for you. It'll tell you where you have to stop. And when you arrive, there's a gigantic thing that has the glowing Tesla name. (laughs) Grab the cable and plug it in. And you don't even have to swipe a credit card. The car says, hey, thank you. I'm getting my fuel now. Go grab lunch. Right. And it's it's a great customer experience. And that has not been really created from the legacy auto brands because they've never had to worry about fuel. They just said, well, we're just going to build the cars. The, the fuel has always kind of figured itself out. So we don't build fueling stations. If you buy an electric car from us, you, you know, you'll charge it home or you'll go figure it out. And the consumers aren't motivated to do that. They- well, it, scare, it scares people. You know, they're like, well, I mean, the obvious is, can I get to where I want to go and back before I run out of gas or, exactly. or, or electricity in this case? But the other, all these other aspects I think you're touching on are, are really important and they they may sound a little obscure or like, come on, to car guys, car gals, or people that are in the know. But honestly, for most people, and I have plenty of friends around here who could go out and buy a new Tesla today, the only thing that keeps them from doing it is those unknowns. There's a cut like, well, how do I, like, how do I, where do I plug it into my house? Is it extension cord or... Yeah. So yeah, we need no, this stuff. It's the way that we looked at it is we said, okay, if, if, if the competitive product that people have used for decades is so simple that they can say, I use regular and they can use that word and travel anywhere they want in the country. And we've done a lot of research studies into this to find out how consumers think of fuel. And that word was used by over 70% of respondents. Another 20% said the word premium. And so we're looking at this thinking, okay, there's two words that can that, that compromise over 90% of respondents way of understanding fuel. And they just literally remember a word. And so we, we said, okay, if, if that's the simplicity of gasoline, that's a great user experience. That means the user experience with electric fuel has to be made just as easy. 
And so I, I can't magically wave a wand and make all the physical plug types become identical overnight. And I can't change physics when it comes to, you know, how, you know, electrical engineering works with, with how fast you can put current into a battery, you know, and power into a battery. So I said, all right, well, how can we explain it in such a way that a consumer will understand it? So we converted the plug types into colors. And we said, okay, fine. If you're going to drive a Chevrolet Bolt EV, you just go to green stations. That's all you have to know. The green plug works for you. Then the only other element they have to figure out is what's the power level. And based on the power level, they will get a better charge. So the higher the number, the faster your car will charge. And that's all you need to know. And then that language is then created into a software platform that you can download to your phone. You basically just tell Chargeway what car you're driving. And you don't have to learn all the stuff you don't use. It just automatically shows you what you use and safeguards you from that anxiety and says, hey, don't worry about all the other stuff. Chargeway just shows you what your car does. And then if you have a multi-car family, you can add other cars and swipe through them on the map to see how that other car might charge. I I love this. I think it's pretty cool. And for older older listeners out there, they'll know what I'm talking about here. Uh, I'll ask you, Matt, but you're a car guy. You probably heard of this. Ever heard of ethyl fuel? Ethanol or? No, no. I knew I. I knew you were going to go there. No, <laughs> ethyl. Yeah, like I pull into a gas station, say, fill it up with ethyl. Okay. No, I mean, I have not. I'll be honest. There you go. So there's a, there's an old term in gasoline. goes back to even when I was a little boy, they had ethyl. And basically, it was the first anti-knock gasoline, but yeah. uh, kind of like a premium, I guess you might call it. Uh, some folks might uh, debate me on that. But again, the evolution of fuel and how it's been used and so forth, and I mean, that's a term nobody You'd have to be my age to know what that means, probably. (laughs) I just aged myself a little bit. But I think it's great what you're doing with Chargeway. It's very cool. And you have a website, Uh, chargeway.com? It's chargeway.net. We we do own the .com, and it goes to our website. We're going to be building out that in a while. But it's, yeah, chargeway.net. There you go. Awesome. I'll make sure I put a link to that on Matt's show notes page. You can go there, have a lot of fun, learn a lot of different things. No doubt it's going to be evolving, growing, changing as things go. I love what you're doing. This is very cool. Education is what it's all about. So, Matt, up next is the last lap. Before we put the pedal to the metal, let's say thank you to today's Cars Yeah sponsor. Everyone who knows me knows I'm really picky when it comes to my cars and keeping them looking new. I'm a huge fan of Covercraft floor mats. I've protected my vehicle with their products for decades. Want to keep your vehicle's interior looking new? It's easy with Covercraft floor mats. They will protect your vehicle's factory carpets from daily abuse, weather, pets, children, weekend adventures, and those everyday spills. It's a fast, easy, and stylish way to keep your vehicle looking new. Covercraft floor mats come in a wide variety of styles, materials, and configurations, all designed for maximum protection. In addition to Premier Plush and Berber Custom Floor Mats, you'll also find cargo liners, canine cargo area liners, dash covers, and sunscreens. Enhance your vehicle's looks while protecting the factory finishes with easy-to-install and easy-to-clean floor mats. Covercraft is the right choice. Learn more today at Covercraft.com and tell them Mark at Cars Yeah sent you. That's Covercraft.com. Are you looking for a way to get your products or services into the ears of thousands of automotive enthusiasts around the globe? I can help. This is Mark Green here at Cars Yeah, and I'd be honored to be an influencer and ambassador for your brand in a unique and personal way. Five days a week, thousands of subscribers and listeners enjoy the Cars Yeah podcast and website. Contact me today and I'll show you how at mark at carsyeah.com or connect with me through the Cars Yeah website at carsyeah.com. Hey, Mark Green here from the Cars Yeah podcast. Did you know you can now see me on the Cars Yeah TV show? That's right. Cars Yeah is now on MAV TV. I visit some of the past Cars Yeah guests and take you along for the ride. Go to MAVTV.com to learn more where you can enjoy Cars Yeah TV. MAV TV is also available on DirecTV, Fubo TV, Fios by Verizon, or you can stream it through MAVTV.com online. And they said I only had a face for podcasting. All right, Matt, we're back, and I have a very introspective question for you. If you woke up tomorrow and you were a vehicle, what would you be and why? Ooh. Well, so here's a fun story. Uh, I I would be what I would call the Chevrolet Jolt. And (laughs) the reason why I say that is is because a few years ago, I pretended that there was a, an electric sports car coming from Chevrolet called the Jolts. And I, using my marketing and branding background, I created a website and all the social media around 
this concept idea of making an electric sports car from Chevy because I grew up a Chevy guy and I wanted to see this. And so I just wanted to put it out for the world to see to see if other people felt like I did. And uh, interestingly enough, there were some people inside of the electric vehicle world that that thought it was a fun thing you know, to, that I had done. Uh, one of, of whom is a, a friend of mine by the name of Chelsea Sexton. She was in the film uh, Who Killed the Electric Car? Uh, she's very well known in the EV world. And uh, she decided to tweet it directly at some people she knew in the industry and said, hey, I want this on, in my driveway. And it went viral. And, and I remember thinking, well, this went bigger than I thought it would. Uh, but, but that car, to me, personified what I wanted to see for the future of the brand that I grew up driving. And so if I could be any car, it would be the Chevy Jolt. And I hope I hope one day they they bring out that electric sports car that uh, that I that I definitely want. <laughs> no doubt. No doubt they will. All right. We are entering the last lap and I'm going to fire off a series of questions and ask you to give our listeners some very quick blips of that Jolt throttle. Boom, boom. <laughs> but it won't make any noise. So, uh, you know, it'll just be very quiet. What's the best automotive advice you've ever received? Ooh, uh, Honestly, uh, it was uh, from a friend of mine that worked at a major, uh, major OEM, and the advice that he gave me was, "Don't come work here." And I, and I, I was stunned. I was very young, but I, I thought, "Hey, this is, you know, this is what I'd like to do." And and his response yeah. was, he said, "Someone like you needs to do what you're going to do outside of our world." He's yeah. like, "I think you'll have a bigger impact if you do things on your own." And it scared me to death when he said it, but yeah. but that was some great advice, and it led me to where I am. Dodged a bullet with that one. Cool. Will you share one of your personal habits you believe has contributed to your many successes? I would say, yeah, don't don't be scared to be different. Ah, I love that. Awesome. How about a resource? There are incredible resources out there today. I kind of have a feeling the one you're going to point us towards. How about there's the one you'd like to share? <laughs> uh, for resources, I, I, I look at a lot of different things, everything and a lot of stuff related to science and tech. So, But if you want to know more information about where I think the future of the industry is going, there are great uh, resources for that, such as Green Car Reports, Inside EVs. And but even even some you know Science Insider for example it sometimes has some very good stuff about where things are happening with you know batteries and tech so yeah. th- those are things that I focus on frankly so very cool and of course Chargeway would be a great resource well of course <laughs> <laughs> that's where I was pointing you but that's okay that's good a little uh, blowing your own horn is no problem here I love to promote my guests yeah. and their businesses if I could wave my magic wand and arrange for you to sit down and have a drink with anyone in the automotive industry living or deceased who would it be. Uh, I, I won't lie. It would be Elon Musk. Yeah, me too. Yeah. yeah. And again, to talk to him. Yeah. Getting, getting to know where his, how his mind works and, and how he approaches things. I, I, I would enjoy that conversation for sure. I have a feeling getting to know how Elon Musk's mind works would be many, many drinks, <laughs> many, many meals. Uh, yeah, that guy's brain, uh, is on another level in my opinion. Just have, I love disruptors like him. I love people that do the kind of stuff he's doing. I mean, all the way back to PayPal and, you know, how he built that whole thing. I mean, I smile, say, thanks, Elon, every time I sell something on eBay or buy something. It's just so easy. So he personifies what you asked earlier, which was, do you have the vision for what you're going to do with this thing you're building and what's your exit strategy? And he, everything he's done, he had a vision fit when he was younger. I think so. Yeah. It's, it's pretty incredible. Pretty incredible. And he just keeps coming up with more. I mean, flamethrowers? Really? Oh, wow. that, that one, I don't know if that's visionary as much as that's just a great gimmick. But hey, <laughs> we just talked about it, which means he knows what he's doing. So. He does. Absolutely. How about a book? Is there a book you'd like to share with our listeners? I enjoyed that great book, uh, Who Moved My Cheese? But is there one you'd like to share? That's a great one. I, I think one of the books that I have enjoyed was actually the Steve Jobs biography by Walter Isaacson. Uh, yeah. It, it, it really, it's this, the story that's in there really defines, you know, the struggle that occurs for someone who is, again, he was not exactly beloved by a lot of people that even worked for him. He was, he was not easy to work for. Right. His family has said similar things about, you know, his demeanor, but, you know, he wasn't worried about being liked. He wasn't right. worried about being different. He was, he was focused on things that, that we now engage with that changed the lives of millions and billions of people for, for what will be a long time. And yep. I think those stories are important to uh, both tell and read, but also if you are the person that can help create what that future story will be, I think it's an important way to be inspired. Yeah, I learned a lot of really interesting things reading that book. It just blew me away. Some things, I, a lot of things I didn't know about him, but uh, yeah, amazing guy. Uh, passed away far, far too soon. Yeah. I'll remind our listeners, you can find all these great resources on Matt's very own show notes page on the Cars yeah website. Just type Matt Teske, T-E-S-K-E, into the search bar and that page will pop right up. All right. We're up to the checkered flag here, Matt, and this last question could be a bit of a doozy. I'm going to buy you any cool collector car on the planet today, but there's a couple rules. You can't sell it to buy a bunch of other toys with. You have to drive it. No garage queens. Road trips are in order. 
And it's the only cool collector car you can have in your garage, so choose wisely. Ooh. <laughs> Pie in the sky, uh, yeah. based on where things are headed and because I'm focused on what's coming, is I would say uh, the second generation of the Tesla Roadster. Ah, okay. And, Very and nice. It's, it's coming. It's not quite there yet, but there's you know, there are iterations that exist. But that car, to me, would – yeah, that's, that's that electric sports car that I want, right? Yeah, so. exactly. That's the jolt for yep. sure. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, that'll be fun. Can't wait. Well, I'll give Elon a call and say – Hey, pick up the pace, dude. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> Matt wants his car, and uh, I'm sure he'll just go, who the hell are you? Uh, <laughs> but uh, that sounds like fun. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the slot cars are here, and they're here to stay. I love it. Well, Matt, you've taken me on an awesome electrified ride today. I really enjoyed your story. I want to thank you for sharing your journey. Could you offer us a little parting piece of wisdom or guidance before you zip off into the sunset in that Tesla Roadster, second gen, of course? <laughs> If I could think of anything, it would be, and it kind of hits on a lot of things we've discussed, but it is if, if you expect more from your life, go get it. Uh, no one's going to give it to you. Absolutely. That is so true. And obviously, as we mentioned earlier, you can find out more about Matt at Chargeway.net. Are there other ways for people to follow along with what you're doing these days? Yeah, with Chargeway, uh, we are on every social media channel for Facebook, uh, Instagram, and Twitter. So just Chargeway and you'll find us. Uh, And then if you want to follow me and what I'm doing uh, and just my personal thoughts sometimes, uh, you can find me on Twitter, uh, Mr. Exit, Mr. E-K-S-E-T. It's my last name backwards. (laughs) Very interesting. E K S E T. Yep. All right. Dot com. Is that uh, Mr. Esket dot com? Is that what you said? Oh, no, that's just my Twitter handle, Mr. Exit. Oh, Ex- Twitter. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Exit is actually the clothing line that I had for years. So, okay. Yeah. Cool. I will make sure I follow you there as well. And don't forget, for those interested, you can download the Chargeway app on iOS and Android today. Absolutely. Again, listeners, you can find everything on Matt's show notes page. Just go to carsyeah.com, type in Matt Teske, type it the straight way, T E S K E, if you want to find him on Twitter. Back it all up and you'll find them there too. Matt, thanks for being so generous today with your time and expertise and for sharing your amazing, cool experiences with me and the listeners. Until you and I talk again, I'll see you down the road. Perfect. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. You take care of your cars, but who takes care of your investments? Tune-ups aren't just for engines. Updating your financial plan is important too. Your GPS may take you from A to B, but it won't help you on the road to financial freedom. For that, you need a good co-pilot and a very trusted advisor. Chris Kimball, CFP, is just the man for the job. He'll guide you down that road without driving you crazy. For over 25 years, Chris has helped people just like you and me with their financial planning and investments. With a master's degree in financial services, he is eminently qualified, and he's a car guy too. Learn more at chrisvkimble.com or call 866-ON-A-PLAN. Securities through Money Concepts Capital Corp. Member FINRA SIPC. CK Financial Services is not affiliated with Money Concepts Capital Corp. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah. Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah. Yeah.